Issue 65. Sonic says that it was just wishful thinking of his to think Ixis had been defeated by the avalanche. Yeah, it was, to the point where he shouldn't have even thought it. Especially since everyone else survived it with no injuries, even though avalanches are supposed to be lethal. Ixis insists to Nate that he was the one wrong, because he was brought here by his robot. Nate calls him a liar, explaining that Ixis just used his elemental shape-shifting to stow away in Eddie's flamethrowing cyborg arm. Which, which, well, I guess it can melt through the snow here, so that's the non-violent reason for why it's there. I like how the snowbot has an actual name. But with the word cyborg there, that's confusing since he was said to be a bot, not a Robian. Exodus's shape-shifting was the only reason he could get past the mystical defenses placed around Nate's home to keep out beings like himself. How does it determine what's a being that deserves to be kept out? Would Merlin Prower count? He was a royal wizard too, but he's not really evil. Can't be just anyone with magic or Sonic and Tails would be kept out. And did they not notice the magic inside of the fire that was the fire form of Ixus? He should have been kept out anyways. Sonic and Tails get really quickly knocked unconscious by Ixus right as they decide to fight him. And Nate finally explains in his thoughts that what happened was that Ixus is sucking the oxygen molecules out of the air, suffocating them like Enerjack or that evil airbender. Wait, why'd they get so affected by it right away? Can't they hold their breath for one measly second? To try to save them, Nate throws a ring through his stained glass window, causing Ixus to chase it. Ixus is a really powerful wizard already, but he'll chase after one measly ring like a dog after a thrown bone. Fortunately, it turns out that the ring he threw was not something that was bad for Ixus, but instead it's a hologram that was able to be grabbed and thrown somehow. Nate reassuringly reminds them that the protective defenses against Ixus will keep him outside for now, and is finally able to introduce himself. Who introduces himself as Nathaniel? You'd think he'd want to go by Nate. He says that Sonic is too rash to be his father. Sonic says that all this time chasing Ixus, he was completely unaware that Ixus was looking for Nate. And then Sonic naturally asks Nate how he knows his father and Ixus because he's an overlander. I like how he was nice enough to say no offense after that, proving that he doesn't hate all humans. Nate then explains that he was once some random geophysician who headed an underground team of scientists in the overland city of Megapolis. From this panel, it looks like he was talking about working on a ring, but the text just says 1D. They were working on a viable alternative to fossil fuels, but he was worried that he should wait before testing. And his assistant, Robotnik, assured him that he had checked all of the calibrations. Unfortunately, something bad happened as a result of him following Robotnik's advice, and was arrested for negligence, endangering public lives, noise pollution, and so on and so forth. It's a shame they didn't blame Robotnik instead, who was really responsible. That could have prevented a lot. Since Nate hadn't caused any loss of life, his supposedly lighter punishment was that he'd be banished from Overland, and if he would survive his trek through the Badlands, which I still don't know what's so bad about them, he might be killed by the Mobians who come into conflict with his kind. What, do Overlanders think that all Mobians are murderous? Fortunately for Nate, King Acorn extended his hand to him in friendship. Then I promptly rolled my eyes at learning that because the Mobians are hippies apparently, they are so fixated on the preservation of nature that their kingdom had remained in a pre-industrial state. And yet their medical technology is complete garbage, as Dr. Quack and the stasis tube had proven. Which is weird because there are countries in the world in pre-industrial state, and they're in the third world. The only reason they even have stuff like cell phones and medical technology is because other countries help them out, but the Overlanders don't seem like they do that for the Mobians. And again, the Echidnas weren't pre-industrial, so did they have technology that didn't endanger nature? It's just that the kingdom seemed to be better than that. Anyways, Nate had finally gotten peace, even being accepted as a member of the royal court. Then he resumed his work, despite what happened last time, finally having the necessary components to safely complete his tests. A chaos emerald. That was the new clean air power source he'd been trying to perfect for years. Why did they need to perfect that? It's because of him that the Acorn Kingdom got the technological golden age and the city of Mopatotropolis was built. So that's why the kingdom seemed better than that. It's not pre-industrial anymore. Nate then explains that while there were four natural elements on Mobius, now there was a fifth one, the power ring. But I thought rings were always all over the place, a natural force of nature. How are they, and how are they relevant, and how are they elements of their own right? They're, they're just magic. Nate was hailed as a hero for what he did, and later watched with pride as the young Prince Maximilian was crowned. Now the environmental ringmaker, he spent his time teaching people like Jules and his brother, 
Unfortunately, certain advisors of the king were threatened by his presence, I guess because he was a human. When one of them, Ixus the royal wizard, couldn't convince the young monarch of his alleged traitor's nature, he went to other allies. General Kodos was a huge racist against Overlander, so it was easy to convince him. Nixus's plan was to control the already strained emotions of a lost contingent of Overlander ground troops. So he brainwashed them? Why the hell didn't he just brainwash the king instead of going through this overly convoluted plan? Or does it just mean that he manipulated them the normal way? That would be kind of underwhelming for a wizard. But, but wait, why? Why would he? The humans wouldn't listen to him because he's not a human, so why would they allow him to manipulate them normally? Kodos, some troops and Nate would run into the lost soldiers while performing an environmental survey of the Great Forest. Naturally, the two groups started to war, just as Ixus had planned. The wounded Kodos lied to the king that it was Nate who revealed the location of the kingdom to the Overlanders. How the hell did they not know where the entire kingdom was? It's not exactly easy to miss. Whatever happens to satellites, Google Maps, you can't hide a kingdom. And I thought them taking forever to find Knothole was bad. At least that was a small village in a forest. And isn't one kingdom... Like, I thought Megapolis was supposed to be technologically advanced. Why wouldn't it... What? Kodos and Nate were the only survivors of the skirmish. And while fortunately the king wasn't stupid enough to buy that Nate was responsible, Nate blamed himself for everything that had happened and exiled himself this time, having caused enough problems. By sheer accident, he had stumbled down the hollow stump of a tree, but decided not to live in the underground grotto, Hidden Valley of Knothole. Which is pretty convenient, since maybe if he lived there, the Freedom Fighters wouldn't have decided to establish a base there. Or maybe they would've, and he would've been a Freedom Fighter. But then he wouldn't be here to fulfill his purpose. What he did do here was leave a memento. He decided that ring technology was too powerful a force, and people like Ixus would just exploit it for their own selfish purposes. You mean like villains would exploit anything else? That's no reason to throw it away! But yeah, he dropped the ring forge into a deep lake where no one would ever find it. Wait, is that the explanation for the lake rings? Huh, I like that they actually cared enough to explain that when they didn't even have to. It could have just been natural force of nature. Nate had trudged onwards for a long time until he finally reached where he is now, explaining that he had become so numb from the pain of his past that he hardly felt the cold temperatures. Among the Overlanders, there have been whispers of mutates that have been created as a result of the Days of Fury centuries ago, and he was certain that the abominable snow beast he found trapped under the avalanche was one of them. So, do the Days of Fury have a nuclear apocalypse or something? Or simply an overflow of magic altering DNA of people just to be a dick? By listening to his conscience and heart instead of following his promise to isolate himself, he saved the beasts and built a castle for them out of stone. Of course, he has to have a castle. And then he lived there until Ixus attacked earlier. How did Ixus even know where he lived? Sonic says that Nate is the answer to years worth of riddles. He is? Nate finally explains that the reason Ixus wanted him out wasn't just because he was a human, but because he feared that Nate's science would replace his magic. How stupid is he to think that? Doesn't he realize that ring technology was powered by magic? That's what rings are! You'd think Ixus would be more confident in magic, especially since magic and science practically work the same way in the comic anyway. Science is allowed to do whatever the plot demands. So they're so interchangeable that one doesn't have to replace the other. Nate explains that the reason Ixus is after him is because he's got a huge ring supply it's looking for. But isn't Ixus already ridiculously powerful? What difference would rings do? He can already shapeshift into four elements and live, brainwash people, possess people, and create illusions to the Freedom Fighters to trick the king. There is the catch that he needs to turn people into crystals to affect them with his magic though. Oh wait, he manipulated some overlanders even though he's not a human like them, never mind. It's no more logical than a millionaire still trying to get money, I guess. It's stupid, but still human nature to always want more. Now for the backup story. In a building close to what used to be your Botanics Command Center, Dulcie talks to Amy Rhodes, who shows her what she's found after a gag about how Dulcie's too big to go into the room to see it. Which makes sense. After some light bickering that shows they have a chemistry together as friends, which is a little charming, I guess, Amy explains that she found a book about a storyteller who could work wonders with his words and pictures. 
A complete set of his stories were donated to the Mobotropolis Library. And despite Dulcie saying that Eggman probably trashed them for no reason, like, I don't know, I guess Eggman has an irrational hatred of books or erupts into an allergic reaction every time he sees them. Despite Dulcie saying that, Amy is positive enough to be determined to find them anyways, complimenting that everyone's been so focused on rebuilding the city that they haven't had the time to consider if anything survived might be fun. So she's positive and fun-loving, like Sonic. It's really a breath of fresh air to see a story about Amy showing off a real personality outside of her love for Sonic. She's really likable so far, even if the story feels pointless. Of course, Dulcie pulls out another bullshit power, saying that dragons, in addition to being living lie detectors, being unable to lie, and being able to be warped to Sonic if he calls them with a supernatural whistle, dragons, in addition to all that, also have a perfect sense of direction. Well, okay, there are actually birds in the real world who always know which way is north because of some sort of thing with the magnetic pole. I think it's doves, actually. So her knowing which way is north is as simple as feeling a little tingling in her ankle every time she faces it. I heard of a guy who got perfect sense of direction by making that possible for him with a little anklet. So at the very least, of all her unique dragon powers, this is the most believable one, having a basis in science. But it just looks bad when put on top of everything else, when she's already overpowered enough, and the ability comes out of nowhere. I mean, I guess it does explain why Dulcie was able to bring Sonic to Angel Island so easily. The worst part is that they find the library still standing, so they didn't even have to have that power. They could have just found it. After Dulcie shows a cautious side, complaining that the library is in a rough section of town and not explaining why, they go into the library, and no, having Amy lampshade Eggman not holding a bonfire for all the books doesn't justify the plot hole. If anything, it makes me even more annoyed that they spotted it and didn't explain it. It is an interesting side of Amy, that she's a bookworm who reads tons of storybooks. It's good to flesh out her character like this. Unfortunately, she leaves because someone else is here. What's the problem? It's not illegal for them to be there, is it? At least they say that they'll tell the others what they found there so that they'll come back with them later, so the story doesn't feel completely pointless. And the issue ends with implying that the next one will finally give us an origin for Ix's Nagas. Well, unless they bother to explain why it's evil, I'm betting it won't do its job. The first story by Carl Bullers was about giving Nate a backstory. And, you know, even though he's a side character, I really do appreciate how, in the comic, they even care enough to give the side characters you just met a full backstory, to even flesh out those characters. But I can see why it can get annoying if you only care about the, the game characters. It was interesting seeing the struggles of a human scientist in the Mobian Kingdom and how Robotnik factored into it. It was pretty creative, and it was pretty sympathetic, too. I don't know why it left me feeling so empty at the end, because it was hardly pointless. It served to explain why Ixus was going after him in the first place. That's pretty important. Maybe it's that he's such a new character and they're already dedicating an issue to his life story, but I didn't mind when they did that with Tober. And the second story by Ken Penders also felt unimportant, but really it wasn't, because it did a lot to try to flesh Amy out as an actual character beyond a Sonic fangirl. It turns out that not only is she positive and upbeat, but she's also a bookworm going wild over a bunch of storybooks in the library. It's nice to see a new side of her. Could have gone without Dulcie having yet another dragon power revealed out of nowhere that didn't need to exist, though. 